Hi, this is Eric with Ameribraid. This is going to be a pretty long video. We can go over a lot of information. We want to answer some frequently asked questions. We want to go over some of the different accessories for people who are in the market and don't know what the different grinding accessories are for. And we want to go over some critical setup procedures. We'll probably come out with some more detailed videos on all those different topics in the future. But for now, this should get most of it across. So if you're shopping for a new grinder, on our website, the first decision you'll need to make is between our two frame designs, uh, the classic or the fastback. Uh, they both use a two inch wide by 72 inch long belt. Uh, they both use the same tension assembly. Both of their primary frame components are made out of quarter inch thick steel. And they both accept two inch square accessory arms and they both accept our full range of grinding accessories. Uh, the most obvious difference you can see in their construction is that the classic is a welded tube frame, whereas the fastback is a bolted together plate design. Um, also the classic is a little bit shallower and taller, whereas the fastback is a little bit deeper and shorter. Um, the biggest functional difference is that we added a second tracking adjustment to the fastback, um, which allows you to run the belt backwards. And we can talk about why you'd want to run the belt backwards in a little bit, but just for now know that the Classic does not have an effective method of adjusting the belt while running backwards, so we do not offer a forward reverse option for this one. Um, whereas if you get a variable speed motor with the Fastback, it will come with a forward reverse switch installed. Um, so after explaining the difference between these two, uh, the most common question we get is why would I order the Classic? And honestly, um, we almost always recommend the Fastback now. It's just the design we like better. Um, we still um, carry the Classic just because we have so much history with it and a lot of people find value in that history. They like knowing that there's been thousands of them made and um, know that they can trust it. Um, not to say that we have any reason not to trust the Fastback, but um, until we can say that we have as many as these out there as we do the Classics, we'll probably keep offering the Classic. So um, either way, whichever one you choose, both machines are extremely stout and uh, very capable. Uh, you'll be happy regardless of which one you choose. So once you've picked which frame you're going with, the next thing you need to pick is which motor package you're going with. And uh, we still offer our grinders with no motor for anyone on a budget who needs to source their own motor from Craigslist or eBay or anything like that to save a buck. We totally understand that. But uh, the only caveat to that is it's a little riskier because uh, there's always a risk of fitment issues because we just can't take into account all the different motor sizes and positions of electrical boxes and things like that. So there's always a risk that there's going to be fitment issues if you try to provide your own motor. If you do get everything from us ready to go, um, then, then you can pick either single speed or variable speed. And that's going to be the biggest price determining factor in the whole process. So I'll try to explain some reasons why you'd want variable speed to help determine if it's something you need. Um, to make it see, see if it's worth that price jump for you. So if you plan on working with multiple types of materials such as steel and wood, uh, the best belt speeds for metal is really fast and will probably burn the wood. So technically you could get away with a single speed machine with a small drive wheel so that it's always running the belt slow enough to work with wood, but you'll be sacrificing performance on the other end uh, with metals by trying to go for something that's just okay all around instead of optimized for what you're working with. Um, another reason you'd want variable speed is to slow the belt down if you're working with um, our small wheel holder and uh, running small wheels. Um, in order for these little wheels to keep up with the belt, they have to spin way faster than the other wheels. So you'll end up overheating the bearings and cooking them if uh, you run it at full speed with a single speed. Um, again, some of the larger sizes of these you can get away with the single speed if you run a smaller drive wheel, but you just won't be able to get away with it 
if you're running anything smaller than one inch really, you'll just really shorten the life of your small wheels. Um, so another big benefit to the variable speed we kind of touched on earlier is that if you got a fastback, it'll come with a forward reverse switch installed on the VFD, um, which is great for sharpening with the edge facing up. Um, well, because it's just really not safe to sharpen edge up with the belt coming down. Uh, we've been sent a ton of pictures of people who have sliced their belt, sliced their contact wheels, sliced their rubber belts on their rotary platens, um, and it throws the knife at their feet and it's just really dangerous. So um, if you want to be able to sharpen with the edge up, then you want to be able to run the belt backwards. Other people have other reasons for running backwards, but for us, the biggest thing is the safety of sharpening with edge up. Um, so I had, uh, also, if you want to run a leather belt, these don't like to be run really fast. Um, so you probably want to be able to slow it down to variable speed. Um, and then finally, just some people like to run the belt slower if they're trying to be real delicate or precise um, or if they're just learning and the full speed is just too intimidating. So um, other people may have other reasons why they like the variable speed, but those are the main reasons we know of. Um, so we understand that variable speed is just out of the budget for some people. In that case, you can definitely get a ton of work done with a single speed. Some people work with a single speed their entire career and they make it happen. But that being said, the most common thing we do here is when people upgrade to variable speed is that they wish they would have done the upgrade sooner. So one thing to note is if you do want to upgrade, you cannot just add the speed controller later. These motors are different. You cannot speed control this motor with a variable frequency drive because it's a single phase motor, which you know most people have single phase power, so that's why we use it for the single speed options. But to speed control it, we use a three phase motor, um, which the speed controller itself generates the three phase power for the motor. You don't need to supply three phase power in your shop. The, the speed controller still plugs into single phase power in your shop but the motor itself is running off a of three phase that's being provided by the box. So if you ever wanted to upgrade in the future, you wouldn't be able to just add this box. You'd have to replace your motor as well. So um, that's kind of the downside of not just making the jump right off the bat. Um, another thing to choose while you're choosing your motor is what voltage you want it wired for. You can get it wired for 110 volt or 220 volt. Um, with the single speeds, the three horsepower has to run on 220, and the one and a half horsepower um, is always wired for 110. But you have the op you have an option for the variable speed to get it wired for 110 or 220. Um, the good thing about that is that you can always switch it later. You can get it wired for 110 volt now. It'll come with a standard NEMA 515 plug, so you can plug it into any outlet. The only downside is that you'll only get one and a half horsepower out of it. But still a two horse motor, so if you ever want to upgrade in the future, you just have to open up the box, switch a setting inside, and put a new power plug on, and then you'll get the full two horsepower out of your motor. And you can always give us a call if you want to do that upgrade in the future, and we'll walk you through how to do that change. Now is a good time to mention that you should not plan on running your variable speed drive on a circuit that contains a GFCI. If you don't know what a GFCI is, it's a safety device and some power outlets. You've probably seen them in your bathroom or your kitchen or anywhere there's a possibility of exposure to water. If uh, one of those is in the same circuit that the sp variable speed drive is plugged into, it'll instantly trip when the speed controller is powered up. There are some settings in the speed controller we can help you adjust to try to prevent that from happening. but it isn't always effective, so it's better to just try to make sure that the grinder will be plugged in somewhere that that won't be an issue. All right, once you've picked your motor and your frame, those are the two hardest decisions. Everything else should be pretty easy. The next decision is your drive wheel size, seven inch or four inch. Um, the seven inch wheel on our motors will give you about 6,600 feet per minute of belt speed maximum. 
and the max belt speed with the four inch drive wheel on our motors is about 3,800 feet per minute. So we always recommend the larger drive wheel for our variable speed motors because you can always slow it down as much as you want with the speed controller, but um, the larger wheel gives you a higher maximum speed so you have a wider range of belt speeds to work with. We recommend the smaller drive wheel for our single speed motors so that uh, you slow the belt down to a more all around belt speed for the same issues we were talking about earlier like burning wood and over speeding small wheels and stuff. So. The only other decision you need to make is the bore size. And that decision is really only there for people who are supplying their own motor separate from us uh, so that they can match the shaft size. If you're getting a motor from us, we'll always make sure that we send a drive wheel that fits the motor you pick. Um, but if you feel like being accurate, our variable speed motors use a 5 8 inch bore and our single speed motors use a 7 8 inch bore. So let's talk about the different grinding accessories that we've got. Um, the, there's three different types of platens we offer. Um, standard tilting platen right here. It's got two two-inch aluminum wheels on top and bottom. We've got the combo platen, which can come with a two-inch, a four-inch, or a six-inch rubber wheel on the bottom. And it's got the same two-inch aluminum wheel on top. And we've got the rotary platen which has three wheels and a rubber belt that runs around the outside. It's got three different working areas, two slack sections and one hard backed section. Um, I always say that if you're on a budget, your tilting platen is your workhorse that is like your most affordable go-to uh, accessory. It can kind of do a little bit of everything. You can grind on the two inch wheels. You've got this flat surface for grinding against. Um, and then if you've got a little extra money to spend, the combo platen just adds abilities to that. You've got your six inch wheel down here or a four inch wheel, um, or even a two inch wheel, but the rubber cushion just allows you to get a better surface finish. Um, but you still have the same abilities to do your flat grinds on your flat platen. Um, if you get a four or six inch wheel, you can always swap them out for another size later because the chassis has um, the spot for the six inch wheel and the four inch wheel on the same chassis. If you get a combo platen with a two inch wheel, it's just gonna be the same chassis as your standard platen. It's just we're gonna send a two inch rubber wheel instead of the aluminum wheel on here. The rotary platen is for completely different work right now. Um, because it's got this rubber belt running around the outside, it accomplishes the same thing as the contact wheel in the sense that it cushions the seam of the belt to give you a better surface finish when you're doing flat grinds. Um, the problem is that w until we come out with our platen chiller, um, it overheats um, if you're trying to do heavy uh, material removal. So right now we tell people to only use this for finishing work. So you still, you don't want a rotary platen without a, some other form of platen to do your stock removal. And then you just only use your rotary platen for finish work or you can use it on one of these slack sections for um, con convex grinding. Um, and then on all of them you rotate them by loosening the accessory arm bolt and you can put it at whatever angle you want. So if you want to put the contact wheel out front and center, real accessible, you can leave it right there. Or um, if you don't feel like pulling out tools, you can always work a little lower and switch back and forth without changing anything. After a platen, I say the next most important accessory to get is a small wheel holder. Um, the small wheel holder allows you to switch between these different size small wheels easily for doing anything that requires that curvature, kind of like a spindle sander. Um, three, we make the wheels from 3 8 inch diameter up to 2 inch diameter in quarter inch increments. Um, so um, when you install it, the shaft collar has to go on the outside because there's not enough room for it in between the arm and the small wheel holder. 
I also always set the small wheel holder tilted back a little bit. That way when you put a new small wheel in, gravity holds it in place so it doesn't fall out. Um, one of the options you'll see on the website is how many deflector wheels you want. And that's this wheel right here. Um, the point of the deflector wheel is to reroute the belt so that the belt comes in at a shallower angle. I'll show you what I mean. If you didn't have a deflector wheel, your belt path would look like this. So if you're trying to grind in somewhere, it would the, that V is the smallest angle you could grind. But with a deflector wheel, you can serpentine the belt underneath of that. And now you can reach into tighter places. Um, for our grinders, we recommend one because of the geometry of our machine. The bottom wheel, you can see, wouldn't do too much. You only need one deflector wheel for our machine. Uh, we offer two in case someone is buying this small wheel holder for another machine that maybe needs to reroute the bottom belt just as much as it needs to reroute the top belt. After you have a platen for doing all your flat grinds and all that sort of work and you've got a small wheel holder for doing your radiuses, uh, people ask then why do you need a contact wheel? Um, so there's a few different answers for that, a few different ways you can use them. Um, we love them, but since you can work do what you need to do with the other accessories we've talked about. I usually say this is one of the lower priority ones if you're on a budget, um, but it becomes necessary if you're trying to do hollow grinds. Um, so that'd be for knife make, blade makers. Um, and then also, even just for general fabrication, um, they're really nice. And I don't have a good way of explaining this, but I'm gonna do my best. But even if I'm trying to grind something straight and trying to clean up edges, I prefer to work on a wheel instead of a flat surface. Um, I'd say, for lack of a better term, I'd say for ergonomics. If I'm trying to clean up this edge, um, it's really easy to just drag it up a wheel and I can see exactly where I'm in contact the entire time. Um, and whatever arc my arm pulls, um, whatever's natural for me, um, works with the wheel. Whereas if I were trying to work with a flat platen at any angle, if it was straight, now I have to make sure I hold my workpiece perfectly flat and I have to make sure I drag perfectly flat. Even if it's back like at an angle, I still have to make sure that I hold it perfectly flat and drag perfectly flat. If I mess up my angle at all, I'm not grinding where I meant to be grinding. Um, the other nice thing about the rubber on the contact wheel is that it cushions the belt seam like we mentioned before. So you get a really nice surface finish and it's really quiet while you're grinding too. There's a lack of noise. Other people claim that there's a heat benefit, which makes sense. I haven't measured it, but since the belt's not sliding against a flat uh, motionless plate, um, there's less friction. So the wheel is rotating with the belt, so there's less heat buildup. Like I said, I haven't measured that, but I believe it. Um, so again, contact wheels are really nice and I recommend getting one, but make sure you get a flat platen or a small and a small wheel holder before you move up to this. We can talk about our water bucket really quick. A lot of people think it's for catching sparks, but that's not the intent. Um, the intent is just to have a summer quick to, um, dip your work to keep it cool. Um, so it hangs from our pedestal stands and uh, the bucket is stainless steel, the mount is stainless steel, and uh, it hangs off to the side there for a quick place to dump your workpiece, to keep it cool to the touch, protect your temper on your blade, or just to protect your fingers. All right, when you go to set up your pedestal stand, make sure you got everything that it's supposed to come with. The hardware kit should include four of these long 3 8 bolts, uh, four lock nuts, and a total of eight flat washers. Um, and then you'll have either two sets of legs or you'll have these bolt down feet if that's what you chose. Um, your feet will also, your legs will also come with feet, either these leveling casters or rubber leveling feet based on what you picked. Um, one set of the legs should have the slots facing down and uh, one set 
of legs should have the slots facing up. And then you've got your actual pedestal itself right here. So it's pretty self-explanatory how it goes together, but there's a little trick I'm gonna show you that makes life a little easier. So <clears throat> when you go to slide your legs together, <clears throat> instead of locking, going all the way together with the slots like that, um, the issue with this is that it's really hard to get your pedestal in both sets at the same time. So the trick is to leave them just outside of each other like this. And then you only have to get your pedestal in one set of legs at a time. And then once it's in, then you just bump it all together. And slide it up to the height you want it. And install your bolts. Alright, once you've got your pedestal together, then if you got the horizontal tilting mount, you'll mount that to the top of the pedestal mount. If uh, you did not get the horizontal mount, you'll just put your grinder directly on top of the pedestal. But to, to attach the horizontal mount to the pedestal, it's easier to move this, the cradle, out of the way and lock it up. And then you attach the horizontal mount to the pedestal with four carriage bolts. With, uh, you want the head of the carriage bolt on top because of the low clearance in, in this gap. So you need the carriage bolt head facing up. Um, once you got those tight, um, you throw the other carriage bolts that come in the kit in from the bottom. And I'll use the nuts that it comes with to keep them from falling out. Just get a few threads on there. And then you drop that back down. You gotta wiggle those bolts to get everything to fall down level. Then you can lock that down right there. Then you can take the nuts off now that they can't fall out. Get those out of the way for now. And try to get all these bolts standing up straight because you're going to drop the grinder right down on top of them. There we go. Oh, I missed one. Oh, that's kind of... There we go. <clears throat> then... Make sure you put a flat washer on each one. And a nut on each one. And use a finger from underneath to hold the carriage bolt locked into its slot while you tighten each nut with a wrench. So, once you got your grinder mounted to a pedestal stand, you can mount your VFD up if you got one. Um, if you ordered a variable speed setup, it'll come with a bracket to mount your speed controller. This is the one for the 1.5 or 2 horsepower model. It'll look a little different if you got um, the 1 horsepower model, but same general idea. Your hardware kit for mounting it will include six of these quarter 20 socket head cap screws, six of these flat head I mean six of these flat washers and six lock nuts. Um, two of these lock nuts you won't use if you got a classic because there's threaded holes in the frame 
whereas the fastback needs the nuts because they're through holes, so you have to put a nut on the back side. Um, so, um, the orientation of this should be with the bend facing back towards the back of the grinder and the long leg facing up. That will give you, put the grinder further back and further up to get away from knobs and things. Um, put the washer on the powder coat side. And that started. And use a 316 Allen and a 716 wrench. Snug those up. And then you can get your two lower bolts started in the bracket. I got that backwards. Washers under the head on this one. And you can drop the slots on the bottom of your VFD under those washers. And then before you tighten those up, you can secure the top so that you freeze up your hands. Oh, same thing, get a washer under there. Same tools, 3 16 Allen and a 7 16 wrench. Now, if you uh, have your grinder with a horizontal mount on a pedestal, you can have your VFD mounted here no problem. Um, however, if you're mounted to a bench top with a horizontal tilting bracket, the VFD will have you'll have to mount this separately because it won't clear the bench top unless you're mounted to the far left side of your bench. In that case, if you're mounted to the far left side of your bench, you can also leave the VFD mounted to the side of your grinder frame. All right, now that you got your VFD mounted up, we can put the motor on and get it aligned. So, set your motor up there, drop the four carriage bolts in the four corners, going from top to bottom. And uh, use a flat washer and a lock washer on each one. Flat washer goes on first, followed by the lock washer, followed by the nut. Leave these loose for now. Just, uh, we're gonna slide it around and get the motor aligned. Once you've got your motor loosely mounted up there, you're going to install your drive wheel. Make sure uh, your key stock is installed. And if it's fighting you, you can install the key stock after you slide your wheel on, but sometimes I find it easier to have the key stock already on the shaft. And you slide on until the shaft is flush with this outer face. And then tighten your set screw with the provided Allen wrench. Now that there's a drive wheel on here, you have something to align to with your motor alignment template. So, when you go, you want your motor pretty much as far forward as you can go. And you want this edge to be flush against the frame. and you want to be touching at the front and the back of the drive wheel. That makes sure the motor is not tilted this way. But now, especially with the fast back with the adjustable motor mount, you need to check at the top and you need to check at the bottom to make sure that your motor mount's not leaning. You can do this same check with your classic grinder frame uh, to see if you need to shim your motor at all. Um, usually they're pretty good, but if you're chasing any problems, um, that's a good place to start is check uh, to make sure your motor's flat by checking the top and the bottom 
and then check for across the diameter to make sure it's not skewed. And then you can tighten down your bolts. You can also use your tracking, I mean your uh, alignment template to get your uh, tracking wheel in roughly a neutral position by holding it up to the frame and adjusting it until it's vertical. So one thing we want to go over too is a common problem that we haven't done a good job of communicating but uh, when you install your contact wheel you need to make sure you uh, use some sort of spacer, we provide one, um, to isolate the rotating outer race from the stationary flange face. If you just bolt it right up there your spinning outer race is going to be rubbing against the flange, generate a lot of heat and shorten the life of your bearings. So you need something that's smaller than the outer race and only touches the inner race to go in between the flange and your contact wheel to create that isolation. All right, so now you've got your motor aligned and your tracking wheel close to a neutral position and you're setting up ex an accessory or anytime you really change accessories. I'm gonna show you how to set your arm position to get um, proper belt tension. I usually start by just sliding it all the way in. That way I know my belt will fit, but that'll obviously be way too much slack. So then I slide it out until I take the slack out. I don't lock it down here. I see a lot of people make this mistake. They lock it down here and then if you go to release your latch, there's nowhere for the arm to move up and release the latch. So the latch is carrying all the spring tension instead of the belt. Also, you'll, uh, it'll be really hard to change belts because your latch isn't releasing enough tension for you to get your belt on and off. So instead of locking it down there, I usually tap the belt right here to add a little bit of slack. That way, when I lock it down in that position, it's really easy to change belts. Also, when I release my latch, um, there's somewhere for it to go up so that the latch is loose. And then anytime you change a setup, always spin the belt by hand um, to make sure that it's tracking correctly before you fire it up. Um, I purposefully misaligned this contact wheel with the spindle to show you the next step um, in setting up your tracking on a new accessory. So I'll, if I'll spin the belt forward and I'll adjust my tracking wheel until my belt is centered on the tracking wheel. And then I'll see how far off it is here and I'll slide my spindle out that amount. And here you can see the amount it was off corresponds to how far off I set it from the line it should have been at. So I'll set it to the line the nominal position contact wheels are supposed to be set at. And I'll move my shaft collar into that new position and lock it down there. And we'll try that again. There we go. Now that you've got your offset set with your spindle to have it track well and forward, you can run it backwards and see if it takes any adjustments um, to get it to track well in reverse. Um, depending on the accessory, like this one, it looks like it's actually running fine in reverse, but if it's not, the adjustment is on the motor mount for the fastback. So um, while it's running backwards, you turn the knob clockwise to bring the belt to the left, and you turn the belt counterclockwise to bring the belt to the right. 
if you ever get yourself all messed up and just need to with combining your tracking adjustment up here and your motor mount down here you can always go back to your alignment template and make sure that your motor is vertical and your tracking wheel is vertical and then start your adjustments again right. most people are familiar with using the work rest in this standard orientation uh, but a lot of people aren't aware of how to reconfigure it to work um, in the horizontal position. So um, our work rest, all you do is you make sure the knob is installed in one of the lower two holes on the angle bracket. And then when you remove it, you rotate counterclockwise 90 degrees and so that the knob is facing towards the ground. And then all you need to do is spin your work rest around until the back edge is against um, whatever grinding accessory you're using. And then you can lock that down there. And then when you're using the grinder horizontally, you've got a nice flat surface to work on. Another feature a lot of people don't know about on the work rest is the angle stop we've got um, for returning to 90 degrees accurately every time. Um, but it needs to be adjusted based on whatever angle you set your platen at. So if you have some sort of reference you trust to be square, you can hold it up there to see how far you're off. And you'll have to use a 7 16th, 7 16th wrench to crack your jam nut loose. And a 3 16th Allen to adjust the actual screw that's the stop. And then you just turn the screw until it's where you like, and then hold it there with the 3 16 Allen while you tighten your jam nut. So another feature a lot of people aren't aware of is that our platen is adjustable forward and back and left to right. So if you want to adjust whether your platen plate is proud of your wheels or sub flush, you just loosen these two socket head cap screws, move it wherever you like, and then tighten them back down. If you need to move your platen left to right, you loosen the two screws holding it on, and they're also mounted in slots in these angle brackets, so the whole thing can move left to right. So that's probably enough information for this video. But uh, always feel free to give us a call if there's any questions you have setting up your machine or how to use it. Um, we'll go into more detail for each topic with future videos, but leave a comment, follow us on Instagram and Facebook to stay up to date, and we'll see you next time.